Welcome to Fashmash Pioneers, the speaker series where Rachel, Arthur and I bring together the globe's brightest minds shaping the future of fashion. For those new here today, Fashmash is 10 years old this year. It's a global community aiming to encourage dialogue and sharing of ideas to shape the future of fashion. And our speaker series, Pioneers, is a key part of that. We are delighted to have Lucy Siegel joining us today. She is, we only have one way of describing her, Rachel, my co-founder and I, she is the OG of sustainable fashion. And she's been on our hit list of people we would like to speak for as long as I can remember. The author, journalist and opinion leader published the seminal To Die For, Is Fashion Wearing Out the World? a decade ago, and it is still a seminal text to fashion education courses around the world today. Eight weeks ago, she published Be, she published Be the Ultimate Friend of the Earth. It's a quiz-based book in her typical relatable style for which she is known. In her own words, it doesn't gloss over the bad stuff. This is your planet, so know it, enjoy it, be part of it and protect it. And something I particularly liked as a person who is fearful of change, she said, you feel more fearful of change when you don't understand the reasons for change. Before we delve any further into our topic and our speaker today, I wanted to thank our sponsor, Clavio, who have been sponsoring us for well over a year now. They are an e-commerce marketing platform for brands of all types, shapes, and sizes, from Marc Jacobs to Fenty, and of course, to Fashmash. We have used, we've used them now for a year for all of our e-commerce marketing needs. Uh, well, sorry, for all of our email marketing, we are not an e-commerce platform, that is my fault entirely. Um, and we couldn't recommend them enough. We're talking seamless customer service, really excellent and insightful target, targeted marketing, and also very good uh, insight, insightful reporting. Most of all, they have a, a customer service team that can help us through all aspects of our marketing, and we really, really couldn't recommend them enough. If you would like to give them a go, please do. Just go to clavio.com forward slash fashmash. That is spelled K-L-A-V-I-Y-O dot com forward slash fashmash, and you can start your free trial today. So back to today's speaker, Lucy. Her knowledge and vast writing base is used to inform high profile individuals on an ongoing basis, including musician, climate activist, and UNIP ambassador, Ellie Goulding. She was also, Lucy that is, co-executive producer of the seminal documentary, The True Cost, setting the stage for how wider audiences perceive and understand fashion's impact on people and planet. Indeed, her book, To Die For, which I mentioned earlier, provided the basis for that documentary. That's not to mention the fact that she co-founded the Green Carpet Challenge with Livia Firth in 2014. And in 2015, Livia and her came up with the concept of 30 wares to encourage a more slow fashion stance amongst global citizens. It's a concept that they're now questioning, but it was one that they came up with in 2015 and it really changed a lot of consumers' perspectives. True cost, Ellie Goulding, 30 wares, green carpet. I'm sure you will agree that these are some of the most headline pivotal moments in sustainable fashion over the last decade. And they all come back to Lucy. They have moved conversation from niche to mash, to, to mass. She is instrumental in shaping and influencing the narrative around fashion's role within the climate and ecological crisis from calling out greenwashing to using entertainment as a lever. I can't wait to listen to this conversation this evening, and I'm sure you all agree. A few notices before we go any further. First of all, charity. I wanted to remind you about donations. Since the pandemic, we no longer charge for our tickets, but we do request a donation to a charity of the speaker's choice to thank them for, them for their time and expertise that they are giving this evening. This month, we will be supporting Lucy's charity of choice, Samburu Girls Foundation in Kenya. It frees indigenous Samburu girls and young women from child marriage, female genital mutilation and beading, a practice where girls as young as eight are sexually exploited. 
It gives them the opportunity to access education and to live in safety. Please give what you can. Flashmash always donates and every month to the charity of the speaker's choice as well. To date, these talks have supported charities including the Prince's Trust, Trust Scythal Black Sisters and SmartWorks. Also, please remember that we always have a Q&A uh, segment at the end of our talks, and we would love for all of you to get involved. Just drop your questions into the Q&A box or into the chat, and I'll be chairing that discussion after Rachel and Lucy speak. Then feel free to share any ideas that you might have also on social media. We are at Fashmash on Instagram. Finally, it's time to hand over to Rachel and Lucy. So if you could please turn on your videos and unmute yourselves, I'll pass over to you right now. Thank you, Rosanna. Thank you. What an amazing introduction. Oh my God. It's all you, Lucy. It's <laughs> you. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us. As Rosanna said, we've been seriously looking forward to this. So um, yeah, let, let's, let's jump in. Um, as Rosa mentioned, you wrote To Die For well over a decade ago, and that has been completely instrumental in certainly shaping a lot of my thinking, as well as um, the wider narrative around fashion's role within this crisis. I can imagine for you, it must feel as though so much has changed, and yet also probably very, very little. I'd love to just get your perspective on that. Like, what do you feel optimistic about in terms of progress and where do you think there is still huge room for improvement and potentially even disappointment for you? Yes, I mean, it's such a great place to start. And I was thinking about the lineage of the book and the legacy of the book um, the other day because um, Tansy Hoskins, who wrote Stitched Up, maybe not 10 years ago, but it may be in that time has brought out an updated ver version and I um, was very lucky I got to interview her for her book launch um, and she's actually rewritten about 60 to 70 percent because wow. so much has changed and there was so much that we didn't address in those original books that we would want to address now um, and those would um, include subjects like intersectionality um, who had the microphone in, in, all, in all of these issues. Um, waste is a much bigger topic. Fashion waste is a big, much bigger topic now than it was. And we, would, we just used to talk about it then. I remember there were sort of rumours, and I remember um, one of my friends who's a fashion academic saying, you know, the next big story will be all the fashion waste. Mm -hmm. um, and that was something that sort of came out a few years later into Die For, when we had lots of... Um, um, awful footage of um I think those were in Haiti those those sort of textile clothing dumps that we featured in to die for um and then in terms of the social impact of fashion and um the vexed question of the theft of garment uh, workers wages that really would stay the same yeah. and my book was written before the Rana Plaza disaster um, catastrophe and so therefore the uh, what I would need to do now is to obviously include the Rana Plaza catastrophe but has anything substantively changed not particularly and I think a lot of one of the very disappointing things is a lot a lot of the brands that um, co-opted and consolidated their power base in the wake of Rana Plaza, which is completely the wrong, the opposite of what should happen, um, just became even more powerful with the rise of social shopping on social media um, and stuff like that. And now we would also have to address um, issues like um, social offsetting and the use of social media to um, percolate the, or mainstream some really dodgy sort of greenwashy and social offsetting ideas quite quickly. So I don't think that much would be improved. And I think that um, a lot of what was said in To Die For still stands. Why do you think we haven't really had that much, but given you know, how much of a spotlight there is on this topic and, and the multitude of topics that sits underneath it now, why do you think there hasn't been that much progress? Because there's been so much work done on it since, since your book and, and indeed since Rana Plaza to, to try and address it. But underlying, it doesn't feel that we really are making much in the way of progress. No, and I think, you know, there's a meta issue, which is capitalism. And I think that it um, underpins all of that work and it, it makes um, a lot of the work 
it frames it in an unhelpful way. It sort of boxes it in. There's a fashion system that's creating profit. So, you know, somebody said to me the other day, someone who was quite agnostic about brands and industries, but who is expert at traceability of materials across supply chains, says there's never been any incentive for fashion to change. And that was a sad thing to hear, but it's, poss it's probably true. In a, in a, if, you, if you take a sort of wide, wide view. And the other thing that sort of happened is that I think we're much more expert now, thanks to some very good work that's been done, um, not least by people like Mike, Michael Mann, we, we really in, um, much more expert at uncovering distraction and delay. And the same thing has happened with climate emissions, straight climate emissions, as has with associated industries with big footprints like fashion, automotive, uh, shipping. All of these sectors have suffered from the same um, issues. And sometimes that's, you know, it's, it's fairly pernicious. You have um, big industries sometimes buying up innovation. We saw that with energy. We saw that with oil and gas companies in the sort of 90s and early noughties and essentially locking it all in a cupboard, you know, like having these almost Potemkin laboratories. Um, and it never really got anywhere because it was too much of a challenge to the core fossil fuel industry and the core system. And we've definitely seen that with fashion. Maybe it's not as organized because fashion tends to be quite chaotic. Um, and we have seen, and this is true for the UK in particular, we have seen a number of fast fashion moguls um, funneling money into their own lives. So we've, we've made almost no progress in disgorging funds more equitably along the supply chain. And that really can't be achieved without proper legislation. And it's not, it's not legislation that's gonna be forthcoming in this, um, in this system, clearly. Yeah. So um, there are things that have been achieved and there's things that, so, there's been a lot of social progress and cultural progress, but those are some of the core issues which maybe explain why some of those are persistent issues. It's interesting the piece you say there about not really having the incentive to change it. And you're right, I think so much of the reliance over the past decade or so has been on morally doing the right thing hasn't yeah. it yeah it feels hopeful yeah. that we're getting to a bit of a crunch point as you say across sectors where we're, we're getting beyond that and recognizing that actually it has to be the regulation that enforces it to to a degree or, or one can hope <laughs> Well, yes, and you have seen some um, people within the fashion industry calling for more regulation. I mean, Stella McCartney very famously was calling for more regulation around COP26. And, it, you know, it's when you have an industry where, um, you know, albeit seminal figures with, with um, you know, sustainably, sustainability at their core value, but she's not the only one saying that, actually pleading with legislators to help. I mean, you know, that's got to stand for something. You know, we start, we're sort of starting to see the same with energy, aren't we? If you think of um, the guy from Octopus Energy, um, Greg, I can't remember his surname, but, you know, just standing up and saying, please reform this hellish system. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. I mean, if we start going into that, we can talk about all sorts of systems that need some. Uh... Yes, but they're all they are all related and there is commonality oh. between them. And, you know, sometimes depending on where your 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 theory stems from, you would look at all of this and say, well, this is what late stage capitalism does. And this is the impact and the correlation between late stage capitalism and um, the natural world. It is really interesting seeing that um, that level of conversation, that that sort of focus coming certainly feels like to me more and more to the fore that we're actually willing to address that topic because and I really think that's changed in the last year or two years you know sort of through the pandemic and beyond it's the conversations feel like they're shifting which I hope is a really positive thing that you know even the word capitalism is being said in the same conversations as recognizing what is wrong with fashion um, which... Yes, totally. And actually, I was at something the other day, which I'm not allowed to give the details out about because it's un under embargo for another month. But it was a very sort of high profile event for that part of the fashion industry, a very specific area. And, um, you know, we started having a, a, a discussion on stage. It was my fault because I was chairing the panel about um, how um, 
the source of the supply chain we were talking about, how it fitted with um, the global climate regime. And then we started talking about <laughs> concentrations of atmospheric you know, gases, essentially. And I said, oh, my God, this is going to lose the audience like nothing else. You know, how boring. And there were journalists there and they were like, no, this is real. And this is like one of the few sustainability um, panels, forums that we've been to in this area which has had any substance and they couldn't believe it. And that's a change, you know, that's a change. Um, you, I mean, you, you would literally screen. I mean, you and I probably, you know, shared loads and loads of different things. You know, people would say, oh, you're not going to say this, are you? Like, you know, maybe five, 10 years ago, you're not going to get into this, are you? Or, you know, no one understands what that means. Now they do. And I think there is a pervasive sense of this is, we're in the last chance saloon and we better, play accordingly and if you don't have these conversations people are like why didn't you say that you know if not now when yeah absolutely which makes me think I, I want to come on to greenwashing because um, that obviously comes into part of this conversation as well but but before we get there just some of the issues you mentioned obviously there's so many different parts of it and, and they are all connected inevitably but I was talking to somebody recently about the, the sort of pendulum if you will between environmental and social justice and how within this industry we seem to swing from one to the other in terms of which one we consider to be the more important at a certain moment in time in terms of you know whether it's grabbing our headlines or indeed probably within an organization it's the one that we're sort of prioritizing the most um, you obviously have have always covered both and we both know that you really do need to obviously be completely integrated, are completely integrated, um, if we're going to see that change. Do you see that happening now within fashion, that people are recognising the two are inextricably? No. No. no absolutely <laughs> not. Please explain. <laughs> I, I, I just see that any chance people get, they will just talk about the environmental impact. Um, it's easier for them. It's easier, you know, they can use stuff. There's, there's, you know, it's not always their fault because there's a lot more um, metrics available, some of them pretty dodgy, where they can like grasp on and they can market, you know, they can sell off the back of it. It is still really hard to sell off the back of things like living wage and the, the lack of um, ability to sell or make those stories travel means that um it, it's still in its infancy really um and there is probably probably no magic formula for making stories about human suffering and um a transition you know we talk about transition from fossil fuels to renewables all the time but we don't really talk about transition from poverty to living wage and what that looks like and how we would model it and where it, people just think it, at their core, they think it's impossible. And they buy into a lot of um, myths about, um, again, to do with capitalism, because we've been schooled in, in we're, we're perfect capitalists who've been um, schooled in consumerism since the year dot, most of us, you know, most, not all of us, um, you know, um, I'm sorry to all the Marxists watching, but <laughs> most people are, and that's what they understand. And, you know, to a certain extent, you really sort of drink in and believe, look, if we give something there, we have to take somewhere else we don't really question or dismantle this set of assumptions at all. And I think there's a lack of, um, there's a lack of people who are talking about doing that. There's a, you know, there are some amazing foundations and um, experts who model different ways of, you know, I, I mentioned before, disgorging um, profit in the supply chain. Um, you know, there's fantastic, I mean, it's not, I, I don't want to sound like I think it's a good thing. There's, there's a lot of very good, crunchy, granular data on wage theft that mm. could be used by clever people with brains. You know, big brains could come up with something really interesting. You could have like marketing and creatives and advertising agencies like look at this and work out how to do something with it. But they're not. They don't. They don't do it. And there's just not the same energy um, or belief that goes into looking at these um, issues and how to undo them as there is in um, environmental solutions or solutions to footprint or, or circular economy. Um, you know, it's like weird, isn't it? Because in this instance, waste 
is sexier than people, actual humans. And it's to do possibly as well with racism, colonialism. And what all, always has struck um, myself and Livia actually, is that really, there's a, nobody really joins the dots between um, garment workers, mainly female, mainly young, um, being exploited sort of 24 seven in the supply chain and having their wages robbed and global feminism. You know, why is that? I mean, for me, it's like an A1, you know, all, all the talk of empowerment around fashion and clothing is around good fit, having access to sizes, being who you want to be, expressing yourself. It's a very selfish definition of feminism, as far as I'm concerned. Where is the, you know, where's the sisterhood in this, in this argument? And that there are some people who do it really, really well. And I'm thinking of a few examples um, you know, there's um, a shop and an online, um, I don't know what to call them, retailer platform, um, Wow Sancho in Exeter, I think, in Devon. Um, uh, there's another one, which and the name will come to me in a minute, um, in London, and just really joining those dots. But still, I think that there isn't enough energy and dynamism going into that area. No, that's completely fascinating. And I, lo I love the way you, you've explained that landscape so wholeheartedly. Uh, one of the things I find really mind blowing about it, sort of related to the way that you just outlined it, is that the people part is actually the much more tangible part. You know, and so, yeah. you know, as you were just saying, when you're talking about the actual climate, the technical detail of the climate, it's so intangible. Like none of us can see actually what's happening in the atmosphere whatsoever, but we grasp hold of that as if it's something we can change. But it feels as though so much of it is just because it enables us to keep on doing business as usual. And that mm. human side of it actually is a little bit more, it is trickier, I think, because it makes us actually address really what fundamentally has to shift. Which Although, you know, I think it would be a great thing to look at in close detail. And, you know, sometimes I get students coming to me and saying, oh, I'm looking at, you know, plastics and fabric and blah, blah, blah. And I'm saying, yeah, that's great. But there's loads of people doing that. Why don't you look at all the living, have access to all this rich data? And you know what? You can, you can, there are organizations who will put you in touch on the phone, on WhatsApp with an actual real life garment worker. And you can ask them all the questions that you need. You know, it's so, like, like you say, it's really tangible, really, really tangible. And I think it's also to do with, there's just so many myths, isn't there? You know, so you get you get into fashion. So for my generation, you know, I lived in lots of different places in the UK and Ireland, but none of them were fashion epicenters. Let me tell you, Mullingar in the 1980s was not a fashion epicenter, if you can imagine. Um, I'm sure it is now. Um, but you, you, you watch the clothes show or you had a book about Vivian Westwood or you knew what a pirate boot was. And then you sort of gradually, um, you didn't actually have the physical stuff, but you kind of lionized this industry and it seemed impossibly glamorous and you're always striving to be part of it or connected to it. And that has never really gone away, has it? So you think of like who your allies are in this industry, in fashion, and you think, oh, it's the designers, it's the shows, it's the this, it's the that. You don't really often think my allies are women who work in Bangladesh, but we've got much more in common with them, gen genuinely, because most of us wear clothes that they've made than we do at the more, you know, highfalutin, glamorous end, mostly. So it's just, I think that goes to the heart of a lot of these discussions about consumption and climate. Who are our allies? Who would we actually stand with? And where could we actually affect change? Whereas where do we aspire to affect change? And yeah, fashion's all been always been about aspiration. And maybe that is the thing that needs to change. Yeah, yeah really nice. And, and, and it leads me perfectly onto greenwashing, that difference between the change we're trying to actually affect and the aspiration to it. You are the queen. <laughs> <laughs> certain businesses and certain people on greenwashing I one of my favorite things to do is look at the comments that pop up underneath um different people's posts when they make certain announcements on certain things and your name is quite often there calling out whatever injustices you see um oh, you, no. you know in a very positive way Karen I'm the Karen of the internet 
<laughs> no, no, both. Why are you doing this? <laughs> but it, I actually did it to one of the Real Housewives of Cheshire the other day. She just posts cons constantly about how she goes on holiday and where shall I go next? And I just couldn't stop myself. I said, do you ever worry about your carbon footprint? Love it. I haven't heard back. No, oh, weird that, isn't it? <laughs> um, yeah. So this is where I'm going to drop on you the piece of news that came out today that you said you haven't seen. I'm sure some people... Oh, God others haven't and the reason I'm saying it is because one of the things you're very good at doing is um or a previous example I won't name names but a certain influencer partnered with the fast fashion brand as their sustainability advisor that was one example another example was um certain reality tv shows about fast fashion brands and you know you, you are good at having an opinion on these things which we all really really value so I would like your opinion on the news that uh Kourtney Kardashian is now the sustainability ambassador for Boohoo uh, I mean, that's just so ridiculous. <laughs> Is she going to go to Leicester and go around with the, you know, well, Pretty Patel's just left, but which, well, is it, has Braverman been announced yet? Is she going to go with the Home Office and look for um, illegal immigrants in Leicester? Okay. You know, how, how, how granular is she going to get about Boohoo's operation? Um, <laughs> very concerned about it when they discussed the idea of her coming on board, which is why they decided to take a sustainability angle with the partnership. But is she coming to Leicester? That's what I want to know. You know, I think these are the questions that need to be asked of her because I think that um, you know. So let's let's just if we if we go back to Boohoo's um, moment of madness, as they like to call it. So during COVID, um, there was a spike in in cases around the garment making um, hub of Leicester in you know in in um, the middle of England and it was traced back to suppliers for Boohoo via a Sunday Times investigation I think there was maybe two or three weeks that they ran investigations of very very good and um they sort of clarified what everybody knew certainly in the media everybody knew that there was um issues going on in um supplier factories in Leicester where people were didn't have the correct papers, were being underpaid, they were working long hours, and they had a couple of undercover journalists who experienced this. Um, and subsequently, what happened was that there was a great sort of outcry, especially from government at the time, saying this is not on, and you know we're going to do something about this. And I think they might have launched a police investigation because it was a legal matter because they were breaking, um, you know, the COVID regulations about you know uh, working time directives and all of that kind of stuff, and um what happened as, as I, I looked into it afterwards and what I found out was there had only been one prosecution and the prosecution was of um a poor worker who'd been working in the factory and been exposed you know everyone was exposed to COVID at the height of lockdown because of because they were insistent that they would get their their um they would get their product out or whatever and it was like he was the only person that was prosecuted for not having the correct papers. So nobody from management, no one from executive team, you know, it was, I mean, it just stinks. And then what they did was they brought in a retired judge, which this is what you do when people have given up on life or they just want some, you know, something for their top of their pension or whatever. And they wrote this kind of long um, report. I think there's a few reports sort of saying, exonerating Boohoo, like marking their own homework. And, you know, how it was going to become more sustainable and sketching this plan. I don't know if you've ever read one of those reports. Mm. I, I think that they're what, you know, the phrase word salad was invented for. Uh, yeah. As shocking that anybody uh, high ranking in the judiciary would lend their name to such an effort. Yeah. And it's really just taking the piss. It really is taking the piss because we had no accountability. We learned nothing from that incident. And it's hard to move forwards because nothing has been sorted out. And this is a system which is able to um, facilitate brands, ultra fast fashion brands, rapid fast fashion brands, playing the system to inflate their share price and their IPO or whatever, because the valuations on something like Boohoo, it, you know, eye-watering absolutely eye-watering so it's coming together of a very sophisticated financial 
um, system with a very unsophisticated, archaic, if you like, production line and manufacturing supply chain and bashing the two together. And if that is not a symptom of late stage capitalism, I do not know what is. But that's a very long way of saying that I can't stand what they do and how they operate. And I think it's very exploitative. And ultimately, I think what isn't addressed is the fact that they are pumping out clothes that are made of synthetics, which are really plastic waste. And that, you know, we all pick up the tab of paying for that. And in a cost of living crisis, where councils are going to be under unprecedented pressure and cutting services left, right and centre when people really need them. I don't think I think that's the thing that's going to, um, you know, the straw that breaks the camel's back because people don't want to pay for, you know, three doors down boohoo habit or they don't want a new incinerator to deal with this kind of waste, which is where you are. And then you get into territory where, you know, if net zero goes properly and the UK was the first economy of this size to enshrine the net zero laws. Yes, under the Tory government, you know, it did happen. And what if, if we don't junk all that because the new incumbent is not that keen apparently, but we will have to make regional decisions on emissions to meet a proper net zero pathway. And remember we signed up to this by law. And these are the kind of things where you suddenly have to decide, do I want, a ban on cars in Kingston upon Thames on a Wednesday, or do I want a new incinerator? You know, like think of a world where you had to make those trade-offs and suddenly things get really hard and people are not amenable to really, really polluting industries. Um, but there's a lot of assumptions and a, bot, a, a lot of what ifs in that. But what I'm saying is I just can't believe that we are backing uh, such an unsustainable crazy model at this point in ecological history it's so crazy and the kardashian thing is there anything those people won't do for money is there anything it's it's it, i love the way that within within one part of a conversation you know we've gone from the celebrity side of things to insane injustice happening in the supply chain to obviously what's happening with government the cost of living crisis and just the way that all of these things are so interconnected and yet that's so I think for the majority of people that's so far removed that their boohoo habit or indeed now potentially an interest in the sustainable line from one of these fast fashion brands is at all connected to everything else that's happening in the world and how negative it is which again you know from a greenwashing perspective I think is is one of our great challenge it mm. and made a sea of obviously you know very mm. ones otherwise but is a very interesting part of it when you look at it through the lens of trying to understand what's happening in this space and I do think it's incredibly complex for people I, I'd love your view on like how we address that you know obviously we're, see, we're seeing some legislation coming to to or certainly guidelines to to try and address it and we've seen the competition markets authority in this market obviously start to clamp down on certain players that are doing it do i mean do you think that is our only answer within this space particularly to to try i'm not sure that greenwash for consumers is that important mm -hmm. I think it's so I think it's something that the industry should sort out. And I do think it is um, a big issue because it creates such inequity with brands. And again, you know, when we started this conversation and, you know, we were talking about there's no incentive for change. If you can greenwash and say what you like and pretend that polyester is the most sustainable fiber on earth um, through dodgy life cycle analysis, then um, you know, of course, that's a problem. There's really no incentive for change, is there? You could just lie. I mean, you know, um, so it removes one of the incentives. Where I think it's a slight problem is that um, we have quite a sophisticated consumer mindset. And I don't like to talk about people as consumers because we're global citizens with agency, but we've sort of trained ourselves to be like really good consumers and then we've had like years and years of shows like watchdog which i used to watch religiously telling us our rights when it comes to toasters or car seats or whatever so we're very much like it's our right to have this at this point and blah 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 and you know 
it is it's not good if we're being lied to and we're thinking we're making a difference and we're not you know or we're having much more of an impact than we've been sold at the same time there's plenty of ways of educating yourself and plenty of material and if you're not kidding yourself you often know that you shouldn't be buying these things in the first place or they're going to be extremely dubious you know if you're like oh my god which which kardashian was it uh courtney courtney <laughs> courtney kim or chloe um you know oh courtney kardashian sold me this jumpsuit and you know it's not actually really sustainable i'm so crazy about that you know it's like why did you buy it yeah. why did you trust her um so so i don't know if going around calling out it, it is a little bit of a distraction for consumers and it's become part of the part of the whole thing thing of, of consuming fashion at this point I you know I'm I'm yet to understand exactly what calling out greenwash is going to do and how it moves us along do you not think that there's a consumer that is not that informed and therefore when Courtney says this is or you know whatever whoever it is says this is sustainable and yet it is still you know predominantly polyester or indeed is like a tiny portion of a brand that otherwise is pumping out you know thousands and thousands of products that there is something in that in the sense of like the consumer needs to understand it's not as good as it's made out to be and this isn't like a license to just but what's the alternative you know so because 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 the sort of lie the bigger lie might be you you know Courtney could have sold you something that was more sustainable, that was made of cotton. Is it more sustainable when it's produced at that volume in that same system? So isn't that the bigger lie, you know? And I mean, I suppose for me, I take quite, I mean, I have done, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a consumer journalist, you know, that's what I did for BBC, for The One Show, you know, so I do look at consumer law. And I think that for me, consumer law is so that you don't, you know, set yourself on fire when you're drying your hair or um you can you're not defrauded and stuff like that and for me the ecosystem and the fate of the planet is is a bigger issue and uh, it requires a different mindset I mean I think it's really interesting in the UK not to get too deep into it because actually it's not interesting it's one of those things I start saying oh it's really interesting and I think this is not interesting at all but um I was asked to talk recently about the Advertising Standards Authority who clamped down on whichever supermarket on plant-based burgers and you look at the way that these complaints travel through the system and how they make their assessments and it's fairly sort of rudimentary and there's a, a there's a load of guidelines and tricks when you're doing marketing that you shouldn't say about plant-based because you'll get clobbered by the ASA. And I think very quickly it will become like that, whether it's the Norwegian Consumer Council or the French one or uh, the CMA in the UK around fashion. You'll, they'll quickly work out what will get them in hot water and what won't. Yes, and just avoid it. Yeah, it's not going to be a revolution from calling out greenwash, you know, from these sort of slightly toothless, no offence, but slightly toothless um, bodies. And we need to probably, again, focus our energy elsewhere. And is it a distraction? Possibly. Mm, yeah, that's a really fascinating perspective on the on the whole thing. And I think, yeah, the 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 example of the celebrity pushing it, whether they push something different and said, I mean, I guess my argument would be pushing something altogether better as opposed to another version within within the same umbrella on in the same yeah. system. Yeah. Which actually very nicely brings brings me on to, you know, our title for today is Influence and Action. And so sort of looking at the actually both influence and action, but particularly that that action part. One of the things you mentioned to me in prep was about this idea of creating moments of change. And so I want to pivot then to you know what you think some of those solutions would be, you know, through through that very note. And you also mentioned this idea of entertainment as a lever, of which you've obviously been been quite a part of. Can you talk a little bit about what you mean by that and the way the role that entertainment can play in terms of influencing us? Yes, I suppose you have to engage people, don't you? And I think that um, one of the ways that you can, you know, those Rethian values of the BBC to, you know, entertain, inform, educate, whatever they are. Um, but you don't want to be didactic, but there is a truth 
in where we are now, there's a lot of um, people feeling very anxious, a lot of things that people are fearful of, um, whether it be change, not knowing how they're going to heat their home, um, and or seeing wildfires. And, you know, I know a couple of people this year who've been on holiday to Portugal and they've seen a wildfire like really close to them and that's never happened before you know and it's like oh it feels like it's getting closer and floods and all the rest of it and everybody now knows somebody who's been impacted by um extreme weather and climate and the next stage of that coming down the road we know that people are going to be rocked by food insecurity food price hikes and it's scary it's really really scary stuff and you can feel um, like you're bobbing in a sort of sea of shite, essentially. <laughs> Sorry. Mm -hmm. And it's like, how do you get a grip on where you're going and what's happening? And it's, it's definitely that the more knowledge you have, the better. And even if it's just a small amount of knowledge about how the biosphere works, it's really, really empowering. Mm -hmm. And it makes you feel in control. It puts you back in the driving seat. And you start to understand why certain sustainable actions make sense and you start to understand why you should be lobbying your MP for stuff. You know, it's like, you know, if you don't understand what pollinators do or how important they are or how under threat they are, you're not going to care if they, you know, get rid of the park opposite where you live or whatever. So it's all really connected. And actually, the best way to build that knowledge in people is to entertain them. Mm. or to do something entertaining because people some people visually visual some people don't retain information some people have ADHD some you know you know I, I have all of these things and to a certain degree and I, that's why I did a quiz book because I was like how do I retain information quizzes or little tiny stories or little facts so there's lots of different ways of, of storytelling and passing up information and not everything needs to be full-on emotional impact all of the time and if I have a criticism of a lot of this discourse is that it's like right are you ready to be feel absolutely terrible and hear how hard it is to be an activist the burden that people carry you know sometimes I am sometimes I'm not mm. sometimes I feel like laughing or, or like sometimes I think things are so funny you know and then it's it, it's it's I feel like there's lots of different ways of communicating this kind of information. And for example, um, there's an organization called Flight Free UK, uh, run by Anna, activist, um, uh, sustainable travel activist, obviously. And she's doing a comedy night on the 29th of September at Conway Hall in town. And she asked me to compare it. And I was like, oh my God, I don't have to tell a joke, do I? Because I can't tell jokes. She's like, no, 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 it's fine. But there's all these comedians, there's like eight comedians on the on the bill and I recognize them and I'm like, are they climate comedians? And she's like, no, they just, you know, everyone tells jokes about the climate these days. I'm like, oh my God, that's such a breakthrough. Yeah, that's really, really cool. I'm yeah. Immediately, I'm going to get the link from you. Yeah. Because you've, you've said that in terms of, yeah, known known comedians who aren't necessarily known otherwise for, for, for talking about climate or indeed it comes into their repertoire, but it's not, you know, their... Like, well, yeah. actually, but actually, even a couple of years ago, I was speaking to uh, Ramesh Ranganathan and we were talking about how you um, how a comedian who's concerned about these things, because he does an ex excellent travel series where he he does sort of look at these issues, but not like overtly. He sort of smuggles them in. But he was saying that he had a climate bit in his act, and that was the bit that went worse with the audience all the time. And that was a few years ago. So I'm hoping that that sort of changed. Oh, well, you'll find out on the 29th by the time. Yeah, like thank God I'm not having to do the jokes. <laughs> Brilliant. But but how important do you think? You know, Kardashians aside, per that part of our conversation, but why do celebrities, obviously you work with Ellie Goulding, how important do you think those types of people are and their influence to this movement when they are engaged with what has to change? Oh, they're, they're mad, it's mad their importance because their fan base is such that they have so much reach all around the world. And they're actually, what's very moving to me is they're getting to young people who've got appalling um, climate education, no education. You know, in the US, um, um, I have a friend who teaches geography at, um, uh, at a university. 
people don't do geography or they didn't used to before they went to university. And she was like, what? You know, so people with very little understanding of how the biosphere works, how the world works, or geopolitics or anything, trying to make sense of this information. You know, imagine, it's hard for us to imagine because we're well grounded in it and we were lucky. But imagine seeing like a fire or a flood on the news, like local news, and then hearing climate and being like, what? That's, I don't understand what that is. And they contact Ellie and say to her, please help me. Or my dad says, this is not real. Oh, wow. So yeah, so that was her starting point. And she felt like she had to talk about it because many of her fans were very confused and very, very anxious, very, very anxious. So, you know, the good thing is that she can do that relatively quickly and she can do it at scale because of who she is and the following that she has. Um, and then working with the UN and WWF, because she's an ambassador, really helps um, to get the messaging right because we feel such a responsibility to make sure that the information is right. You know, but it's about showing up and stepping up. That's what we always say. And there is a cost. There is a cost to this activism for someone who's well known. So if she posts about climate, she will lose followers because they're like, I come here for escapism. Why are you giving me this? Yeah. You know, so we're talking to the people who are really desperately need help and other people are being alienated yeah. and offended. But that but that's unfortunately, that's what she feels she, she has to do that. Yeah, yeah absolutely how about for you though do you do you have such positive you have such a positive attitude when you come on and you do some of these things but do you and and you do through everything I see of you publicly but how how do you do you have moments where you're just like I can't do this or like give up hope on it and just despair or or no I never despair actually I never ever despair because I always have so much hope I have so much hope that humans will get themselves together I just never despair I mean, even now, you know, (laughs) to be completely frank, um, a lot of people that I work with are really in despair over um, Liz Truss's strange utterances about oil. You know, she used to be a Shell oil employee and she seems to think that's like a massive badge of honour and stuff like that. And I'm still thinking, where's the positive here? The positive is that, you know, first, first economy of this scale to sign up to net zero, got these pathways, got very smart people who know what's happening. You can't, they can't undo everything. They can't shut everyone up. I mean, obviously it's really hard. And one of the things that is really difficult, and I was talking to um, an ex-policeman about this, an ex-detective about this this morning, is that um, clamping down on protesters, on climate protesters in the way that is happening at the moment is something akin to an authoritarian state. And whether or not you agree with um, Extinction Rebellion and you know whoever like gluing themselves to tankers or the M25 or something, there are climate scientists right now who are serving custodial sentences. And there was one last night that Mike Berners-Lee, who I really respect, was tweeting about, and she was being intimidated by prison officers. This is a scientist, a UK scientist, who has been put into a custodial sentence because of protesting about climate. What is going on? Like that is just not acceptable on any level. So that kind of thing, I really, really fear, but still something within me thinks that we will rise up and we will not go all the way in because I just don't believe that we will. But I think we are, yeah, I can see that we're in a very, very difficult, very difficult time. And maybe, maybe the optimism is a bit superficial. I was at something the other week and I, the guy opposite me at this dinner um, started talking about Bolsonaro and what a great guy he was. And I lost it. You know, I lost it. And we had a very, very tense conversation. So within me, there is definitely a reflex where I will really like defend my position. I mean, I've, I think like anybody who holds the sort of views that I hold, the last few years have been really um, disconcerting in the UK because, um, you know, I do think we, I, I've heard some stuff that I never thought I would hear. Maybe that was naivety. Um, but I always think you can't undo all the great science all the great mobilization, all the great teaching, all the great academics 
from fashion to engineering it's too embedded yeah yeah no that's fantastic I want to open it up to questions but just quickly before I do um we're trying to end all of our conversations this year on um asking a speaker to give us their view on action basically so bringing in a really practical note to the conversation um so again looking at fashion specifically I'd love to hear from you what the if you had to choose one what one crucial action would be that you'd wish to see from the fashion industry in this year in or the space of the next 12 months yeah I don't think it's from the industry because I think like that homogenized industry action it's not going to happen but I think that you whatever you do whether you're a designer or a maker or wear or whatever I just talked to um a designer um before and she was just wonderful like she was just like oh, I'm not going to do that. I'm not doing that. I'm not selling. I'm selling direct to customer. I'm not doing the wholesale thing. I was like, oh, why not? Well, because it doesn't work, does it? And it's not sustainable. And even when she was at college, they were like, right, make um, 15 pieces for your final collection. She was like, no, I'll do five. Thank you. Amazing. And I was like, oh my God, this is the real deal. So you can do stuff like that. You know, if you're really like, one of those kick-ass people and I thought well maybe I could be more like that just as a wearer and a buyer and I think actually I don't like doing that and it doesn't make me feel good it doesn't work for me and I'm just not going to do it anymore so there you are and I think I think once you sort of get into that mindset and think this system is really flawed and I do not want to be part of it. So I'll do this instead. And it might be that you go, OK, I'm only going to wear secondhand, which I know a lot of people are doing. Or um, I'm only going to replenish like basic, like, you know, my underpants, you know, what well, I don't know, whatever, you know, like cutting your consumption. I think cutting your consumption is actually quite undervalued and really, really powerful, you know. And sometimes I feel terrible because I've like come out in the same thing again. And this is also a legacy of, of doing TV where there's a lot of pressure to keep wearing yeah. box fresh and, you yeah. know, look, you know, up tr on trend and all of that. And um, I just stopped doing it. And, you know, sometimes I look like a hot mess like today, but I, I don't care. <laughs> you know, that's the way it goes. Yeah. Okay, so your actions are don't engage, don't engage in the system if it doesn't work for you. Yeah, create your own system or give it a kick in the, you know, what, you know, it's like, yeah. Love it. Take but, it on. Um, yeah. Um, be okay with being a hot mess if you want to be a hot Yeah, <laughs> let's have a hot mess day. <laughs> you, yeah. you, know, you know you can scrub up if you need to. Yeah. So where's the panic? We haven't mentioned green <laughs> experience of that too brilliant well listen let me get Rosanna to come back thank you so much for your time I can see we have some questions I will hand over to her and I will see you again in a moment thank you uh Lucy you look anything but a hot mess <laughs> oh, thank you you look a very very hot calm and collected <laughs> lady sharing some seriously powerful ideas and actions for us all and and just um <clears throat> your way of communicating as always is just it's really brilliant. And I'm sure everyone has taken so much from this, but they also have come back to us with their own thoughts and ideas, which I'm going to share with you now. So um, everyone, you can put this both into the chat and the Q&A. Um, let's begin with the Q&A. Um, I mean, one or the other, you don't have to do both. So Charles Ross, uh, Lucy and Rachel. How much faith do you have that the incoming EU Green Deal will do real good for clothing? It seems that three areas of the new law are prominent. Green claims, will this just make lawyers rich? Due diligence and eco-design, chemically recycling most product. Does this miss the trick of not stopping the churn of garments? Is it just appeasing the guilt of consumption as opposed to tackling the root problem? And he's put hashtag wear at least 30 times. <laughs> I love it yes well I think he's Charles has answered his own question yes I would agree with that excellent summary I think um one of the things that happened this summer was that the you know there's been this sort of war ra waging between the HIG index yeah. and all of that kind of stuff and um it was kind of caught and it was caught um finally because there was a very powerful piece in the New York Times yeah. um which basically says 
what's going on here? And just like method methodically went through and showed the errors in the modeling and asked some questions of everybody involved. And then it was the Norwegian Consumer Council, wasn't it, that um that called it out. And um as I understand, the metrical methodology has been suspended. So, but had that not happened, what would that have become? You know, like that would have become the last word in how you assess polyesters and, you know, silk isn't sustainable and in, you know, in comparison because they, because of the life cycle analysis that that was based on. And no, there were people screaming about that data for years and years and years, but not getting through. So um, I suppose that's, that's um, an example of where a change in uh, law or mandate for a consumer authority, as in Nor Norwegian Consumer uh, Council, has led to some good mm -hmm. and will undoubtedly have an effect on the um, EU system and the taxonomy. But it's a very difficult thing. I, I mean, in broadly in principle, I think the EU Green Deal is what's needed. But I think Charles is absolutely right that unless you um, address the root cause of overconsumption and we're sort of now going to have to address it, aren't we, because of the energy crisis mm. and manufacturers and retailers and everybody needs energy. And are, is there, are there going to be limits on that? Um, then really you are not going to cut emissions. You're just going to create a lot of systems that displace one thing with another. and still the fossil fuel finds a way of getting in and look at how that hig investigation took to come to fruition in the new york times you know so yeah. It, it, yeah. We, i just it, it's frustrating how long um these things take before they're actually well, it almost didn't get it almost didn't get um caught you know it would have gone in and it would have been pushed through and lobbied through so we came really close we can't keep letting that happen Mm. Mm. it's a big lesson yeah okay we have um helen o'sullivan i guess this comes down to i can't i'm having real problems i need to say <laughs> everybody apologies today for my lack of articulacy which isn't even a phrase <laughs> <laughs> it should be i'm i'm lacking coffee or it's the rain or something <laughs> okay next question Helen O'Sullivan, I guess this comes down to disassociation and the lack of connection to what is hanging on a rail to the people who make them that we've never met. The climate and environmental cost seems immediate and affects us all, but unfortunately, I don't think people think that when it comes down, I, I don't think people think that when it comes down to the human cost. And then her final note is just never stop being an eco Karen, please. Yay, thanks Helen. Uh -huh. I think that was more of a statement than a question. Yeah, but it's a, it's a very interesting bad. one. And, and what I can't do and what I've never been able to do is to take myself back to the first time that I realised that there was an impact between clothing and the environment. And I can't, I know, I remember actually when it happened, because I remember somebody I knew who was an environment analyst said something about, I had a, a jump, a cardi with all these buttons on and they were like, oh, each one of those is about four grams of oil. And I was like, what? Um, but I can't really remember how that made me feel and how I processed it and how long it took me to process it. So if people are getting this information new and they've been brainwashed to think that, you know, this is the answer to low wage economy or whatever, and buying in bulk is cool or fun or whatever, it's, it's hard to model how, how that is going to work, even neurologically. And how you get these and how you get these points through. Mm -hmm. I was amazed yesterday. I was listening to the radio and uh, there was somebody being interviewed about the energy crisis. And they were saying, you know, we're having to tell our children to turn the lights off when they leave the house. I was like, do you not tell your children to turn the lights off when they leave the house? <laughs> what? I was like, OK, we're not as far along as I thought we were. No, absolutely not. OK. Anyway. <laughs> Wiser. Um, okay. 
Then we have Millie Sob. Many thanks for this conversation. You've talked a few times about the lies of what is sustainable, like for mass produced items by Boohoo. But isn't mass producing impacting negatively the environment? In other words, can global brands like Boohoo, um, Hermes, H&M, et cetera, keep existing while being very sustainable? I'm not mm. sure. If I, I don't understand. Yeah. Um, can they keep exist? Would they exist if they were I think sustainable? Maybe, well, maybe it means unsustainable. Can can global brands like Boohoo and H and M keep keep existing while they are so unsustainable? Ah, um, well, they'll definitely find a way, won't they? And they'll push and push and push until the final moment. And what seems to be happening to me is that they are really fixated on and we saw this with Shein for example um making very distinct moves to because they want to float on the American stock exchange I mean that's known it's known that's what they want to do so it's not just that I'm not sure that they necessarily think these entities necessarily think oh how many years will I be operating for how many years will I be able to bring out 50, 60 collections, you know, whatever. They, they don't really think like that because their objectives are really different and their objectives are things to do with IPOs and flows of capital and, you know, some vertical investment in stuff like, you know, H&M had a, had a share in an incineration plant, you know, come on guys, you know, what do we think is going on here? Like, what do we think these people are in it for? Like, are they in it to become like really sustainable businesses and create really um, sustainable product at the lowest price possible for like almost as a public service? No, they're not. So are they going to like, are they going to run out of road? Yes, but we're all going to run out of road yeah. because of them. So, so that's, that's where I am with that sort of question. Uh, okay, we then have Amuna Nage, and I hope I've pronounced that correctly. If entertainment and engagement is so important, shouldn't we encourage consumers to shop more sustainably by engaging what matters to them most, even if that is looking good in great clothes, pre-loved, of course? And she is the CEO and founder of Circle of Style. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think that's one of the things that I'm starting to see bubble up. You know, I'm doing a local event I'm just seeing if I had a poster with me. I don't, but I live in Surrey, Thames Ditton. And if you want to come here on the 24th and 25th, we're doing all these amazing events, the Climate and Nature Festival. But we have a second-hand September event and I've been contacted by a few sort of stylists and people who are expert in how you restyle um, second-hand clothes and also how you sell them on and stuff like that. You know, and it's like, there's a whole area of expertise, which is entertaining, fun, gives you a bit of a kick you know, it's just brilliant. And the more that is commodified so that it apes the um, non the less sustainable um, um, alternative, I think that's brilliant. I think that's the best thing, you know, because sometimes you can only meet people where they are, right? You're not going to have a whole change of style and mindset and all the rest of it. So you've got to, you, you've got to, um, you've got to try and, um, it's a bit like analog meats. You've got to try and make them something as good. Yes. <laughs> this evening, well, I was going to say, no, I, I will not add there because I'm not, <laughs> anything. I'm not adding anything more brilliant than you've already said. And I've, <laughs> no, do. I've, I've just seen the time, which is 18.07. Oh, no. Oh gosh, there are so many questions still. These are, these are really brilliant, everyone. Thank you. Um, okay, from... Uh, Right. From Sarah Angold, I see you've had your hand raised as well, so I'm definitely going to bring up this one. Hey, great convo. Thank you all. Special place of hatred in my heart for Boohoo, by the way. I'm mm -hmm. interested that Lucy suggests that the cost of living crisis could improve people's call for sustainability. I understand the logic. People shouldn't want to pay to clean up the industry's mess, especially when they are poor. But I'm not sure this is how consumers see it. Don't they just see let's save money by buying cheap clothing? Yes, of course. Oh, yeah. and she's, she's added, and if the above is true, what kind of new narrative do we need to create so that people join the dots? Yeah, I mean, of course, you know, people were told, you know, Brexit, oh, you'll get cheaper shoes. You know, Jacob Rees-Mogg actually said that, you know, it's a lie, it's not true, the opposite is true. Um, 
so yes, people will, people being a terrible phrase that we're always told by a history teacher, never use the word people, who do you mean? Um, yeah, I mean, people, people are totally brainwashed. I've had so many um, people get very angry with me over the years and they're like, you know, we have to buy this. And yeah, yeah, you do. I mean, I've, I've never, ever, ever um, cast dispersions on anybody who is buying cheap clothing. Um, it's it, it, they're buying from a system and they've been told this is the right thing to do and I don't think we should take them on I really don't I don't think we should take on consumers I don't think this is the, their fight but I think we should tell them that they are citizens and that they're paying elsewhere for other people's crap and that I think it starts to break down quite quickly you know I've got um I actually one of the things I did a few years ago was I did a, um, a documentary with Stacey Dooley and that meant that had the benefit of all my young cousins actually knowing what I did for a living because they were like, oh, we really? get it now. <laughs> it's you and Stacey. And they were all massive fast fashion consumers. And it was amazing how some of them, I'm from quite a big family, how some of them shifted really quickly. Oh, so I went yeah. to my auntie's birthday in, in Stoke-on-Trent and, you know, a lot of them were there. And I remember one of them saying, I keep telling Billy, like her sister, I keep saying, you can't do that. You can't buy these five things. You shouldn't be doing it. And they worked it out really quickly. And also the amount of young women who said to me, Fiverr's still a fiver. You know, if I invest it in a course that I want to do or something that's for me, rather than giving it to one of these behemoth brands, that's mm. an investment. What do they say on Love Island? I'm backing myself. So there's lots of different arguments that you can use, but it is, yeah, it's a really good point. And we really do need to be better at um, helping people to interrogate this, just buy it cheap. Yeah, yeah. Now, um, I'm gonna try to squeeze in one more question, but I think if yeah. we can as succinct as possible. Rachel, yes, sorry. Tell me yeah. if I can't. No, no, you're being brilliant. You're so succinct. No, I'm not. You have so many questions. And I know Rachel has a quick fire round for you still. And I can see people dropping off because it is 6 p.m. So yeah. Ian Clark, we talk about super taxes on banks or oil. What about fashion brands from LVMH to Zara to Primark every year? Need a good formula for different companies, perhaps higher tax for half fast fashion. Then profits is not the striving ideal for many of them. Yes, such a great idea. I mean, what's that guy called? He's from the the tax guy. He tweets really well about the energy crisis. Can't remember but anyway. He's from Radio Five. Is he from Radio Five? There's anyway. There's two things. There's a Tax Justice Alliance and the Tax Something Something, and one of them's really sound and great, and the other one is just full of lunatics. But anyway, um, whichever one he is, I'd love to get his view on how you do a taxation system. But I think it's a really good point because I think you know what I would really like to happen is just in media generally. I don't think that we really started to get to the bottom of what Philip Green was doing, for example, until you got Ollie Shah writing a book, the business journalist from the from the Times, Sunday Times, who I think is super good. And I would really like more business journalists to be um, to scrutinize this industry. I think we've started to see it. I mentioned that Sunday Times investigation to Boohoo. Um, but we need all lenses on this. You need yeah. legal, political definitely financial because I think that's where the stories are um so I think we're rather a long way there's not much appetite for <laughs> for any um restrictions on um or uh, uh, any bringing corporations to book on tax um from our new prime minister I wouldn't have thought but um it's a very interesting idea yeah absolutely and yeah the the film greed if everybody if people haven't oh, watched yeah. it Please do. Yeah, that, that's oh, it's it's um, it's absolutely fantastic. And okay. it's not connected to Philip Green at all. Oh no, not at all. Definitely not. No connection. No zero. <laughs> um, yeah, I hope you will have that as your extracurricular watching this evening. Right, I'm <laughs> going to send you back to Rachel. Everybody, if you haven't yet um donated, please do. We're going to leave the event bring event bright link live so that you can do so. Can and I just say one thing? Yes. Sambora Girls Foundation have got, um, they've rescued over a thousand girls. It's run by Dr. Josephine Clare. And we've got at least 35 into universities. And last year we got our first full scholarship to an international university from a girl who was 
sold into marriage at eight and managed to escape. And like these girls, once they get to Josephine, they just are, they just take off. That's incredible. Well, that's yeah. such a great story to end on. So thank you for choosing them as a charity. And no, thank, thank you to you and to Rachel for the conversation this evening and to all of our questions from, from our guests. Right, I'm going to duck out and Q&A time. Thank you, Rosanna. Thanks, Rosanna. Hey, final, final bit, bit of fun. Okay. Friends. So quick fire round. I'm going to give you two things. If you could say which one you would choose out of the two. Okay. Um, totally silly I now the problem with doing this quick fire round is I always want to add so many more to it after <laughs> with you but my brain is engaged with listening to your answers to the Q&A so I haven't added any um right thrifted treasure or a back of the wardrobe find um back of the wardrobe find uh okay green carpet dress or an innovative sustainable catwalk creation Green carpet dress. <laughs> uh, farm or a fashion show? Farm. Kayaking or campaigning? Oh, kayaking is much easier. <laughs> <laughs> you can do both. You can do both. <laughs> um, most of these things you can do both, to be fair. Uh, litter picking or petitioning? Um, petitioning. I hate picking up fugitive plastic. But I do it every day. So you do a lot of it. Yeah, you're yeah. so good. Um, writing a book or producing a film? Producing a film. Writing a book is like the most hideous thing you'll ever do. Oh, my God. Fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> Final one, 2022 or 2032? 2032. Ever the optimist. Yeah, we can do it. We can do it. We've got a, a short window, but we can do it. We can do it. Lucy, thank you so much for your time. It's been an absolute pleasure. I've learned loads. I'm sure everybody in the audience has as well. Um, testament to all the questions that came in. Well, you're so clever. I'm sure I can't teach you anything, but thank you. It was such no. a great conversation. I've enjoyed it so much. And thanks for coming, everybody. Thank you. Yeah, and we're all going to go and look up your comedy night. <laughs> yeah, come along. It's a it's a fundraiser Brilliant. For, for Flight flight Free UK. Brilliant, brilliant. Thank you again so much. And yeah, look forward to keeping in touch as ever. Yes. All right. See you soon. Thanks very much. Thank you. Bye bye.